Next on our list is Larry Eiler. But before we get started, welcome to True Crime with Maneater. If you love all things true crime, including missing person cases, cold cases, and just the strange happenings of the world, you've come to the right place. If you'd like to support the channel, be sure to subscribe and turn on alerts so you never miss a video upload. Let's get started. Larry Eiler was born on December 21st, 1952 in Indiana, and he was the youngest of four children. Unfortunately, his father was an alcoholic who was known to have physically and emotionally abused his wife and children. But his parents would divorce in mid-1955, and he and his sisters were pretty much regularly in the care of babysitters, foster families, or simply left to care for themselves. Their mother struggled to financially support and provide care for her four children, and she would often work two or more jobs at a time. Although Larry and his sisters were often in the care of foster families, their mother did frequently visit the children, and Larry would later claim that the separation and reunions brought the family closer. In 1957, Larry's mother would remarry, but the marriage only lasted a year before she divorced her husband. His mother would marry for a third time in 1960, but again the couple would divorce four years later. She would marry for the fourth time in 1972. It appears that Larry's father and his first two stepfathers drank heavily, and not only was his mother subjected to frequent abuse, but so was him and his siblings. On one occasion, his stepfather held his head under scalding hot water as a form of discipline. Although Larry had all of this going on at home, he did attend high school and he was very active in sporting activities, but it does seem that he was targeted by bullies. It appears that they picked on him because he was from a poor family and his mother frequently divorced. But his sister didn't allow this. She would confront her brother's bullies. And it seems that he was well-liked by teachers. He was labeled a quiet yet likable student, and he had a few friends. But it appears that he became increasingly stubborn and erratic. So his mother would place him in a home for unruly boys in 1963. Larry would find this experience emotionally devastating, and within weeks, he had persuaded his mother to allow him to return home. Shortly after, he did undergo psychological tests, which did reveal he was of average intelligence, but he suffered severely from insecurity and he held an extreme fear of separation and abandonment. The staff who did these tests said that basically this was because of his home life, and they recommended he be temporarily placed in a Catholic boys home in Fort Wayne. He would remain there for about six months before he returned home to his mother. I think what's interesting about this is they knew very early on that Larry was having some serious issues. I mean, it's very obvious that he had abandonment issues. I mean, his mother divorced four times. Every single time she's, you know, marrying a new man who's just as bad or even more abusive. And then he's bouncing between foster care and babysitters. His life was sheer chaos. So of course he was going to be somewhat emotionally unstable. By the time he reached puberty, Larry knew that he was gay, and it appears that he was very open with his family about his sexuality, but it appears that he struggled with this deep self-hate due to his sexuality, and this really isn't uncommon given the time period. Throughout high school, he did occasionally date girls, but none of the relationships would become physical. He had been somewhat religious during childhood, and he would confine in close friends and family that he was struggling with his sexuality because of this. Larry would fail out of high school because he really just didn't seem to care about it, but he did later obtain his GED. He would try college, but learn that it just wasn't for him. And soon he started working as a private security guard. He would work as a security guard for about six months before losing his position. But he would find work at a shoe store. Around this time, he began to kind of engage with the gay community, and he would frequent gay bars and have casual sexual affairs with different men. Many of those men would later say that Larry would avert his eyes from his partners during intercourse while also shouting profanities such as bitch and whore, so many of them believed that Larry was fantasizing his partner was a female. By the mid-1970s, Larry was well known within the gay community of Indianapolis, and it appears that he had a leather fetish. Many acquaintances would describe him as good-looking, 
and a laid-back guy who was an avid bodybuilder and that he was close to his mother and sister, but others who had engaged in sexual activity with him would describe him as an individual with a sadistic streak and violent temper, which would only surface during sexual encounters. They would say that he would extensively bludgeon or inflict light knife wounds upon unwilling partners, and he mostly did this to their torsos. He began primarily working as a house painter, and although he had never served in the military, he was fond of wearing Marine Corps t-shirts. He would live in a condominium with a 38-year-old library science professor named Robert David Little, whom he had met in 1974 while studying at Indiana State University. But the relationship between the two was a platonic one. He viewed David Little as somewhat of a father figure. And then on August 3rd, 1978, a young man named Craig Long had been stabbed in the chest. When paramedics arrived and they were trying to patch him up, he told them a story about a man who had picked him up while he was hitchhiking and propositioned him. Shortly after Craig entered the pickup truck of Larry, Larry would proposition the youth and Craig wasn't interested, so he attempted to leave the vehicle. In response to Craig trying to flee, Larry would press a knife against his chest, and Craig would say, I don't have money. Larry would drive towards a rural field and say, it's not your money I want. I'm not after your money. He would order Craig to undress before he handcuffed the youth, both his ankles, then ordered him to climb into the back of the pickup. Craig would attempt to flee from the pickup as Larry was undressing and Larry would chase after him. Craig would shout, you queer. In response to this, Larry would stab Craig once in the chest, and he penetrated his lung. Craig would fall to the ground and pretend to be dead. The thing is, Larry was only charged with aggravated battery, and he did plead guilty. A judge set his bond to $10,000, and his friends raised the money to get him out. And then Larry's lawyers would offer Craig Long a check, and this check was from Robert David Little for $2,500 if he agreed to not press charges. Craig did accept the offer, and Larry changed his plea to not guilty. He was acquitted on November 13th and fined $43 in court costs. And then it appears between 1982 and 1984, Larry would pick up and murder, at minimum, 21 young men. Their bodies were often found dumped alongside the highway or in cornfields or bypasses, and soon he would become known as the highway killer or the interstate killer. All of his victims had been found with their pants and underwear around their ankles and subject to various forms of sexual assault. They all displayed signs of bludgeoning, they had bruising and contusions, and knife marks on their torso. The victims typically were missing their shirts and wallets as well, and it appears the victims were plied with alcohol and sedatives before their restraint and murder. Several victims were disemboweled after death, and it appears that Larry is known to have dismembered the bodies of four of his victims. By January of 1983, a task force had been assembled to put an end to these murders. They soon thought that each of these crimes was likely committed by the same perpetrator. They knew that they had a serial killer on their hands. They knew the perpetrator had displayed such a level of rage that even the task force was surprised. Many of the victims had excessive head wounds, suggesting that the perpetrator had continued stabbing them long past the fatal blow. They would determine that the perpetrator was likely a disturbed individual who was at war with his sexuality. They said that this person had felt guilty about being gay and about having these encounters with men, and that he killed his victims in an attempt to cover up his crimes and his indiscretions. Although they had a profile of the killer, the task force seemed to be at a dead end. They knew who the killer should be, but they were having a difficult time finding out exactly who he was, and the bodies were starting to pile up. On October 12, 1982, Larry would lure a 21-year-old named Craig Townsend into his vehicle. Although he had been drugged, beaten, and left naked in a comatose in a rural field, he did survive the assault. Eleven days later, on October 23rd, he would abduct and murder a 19-year-old man named Stephen Crockett. His body was discovered in a cornfield. And this was approximately 12 hours after his murder. An autopsy would later reveal that he suffered 32 knife wounds, including four to his head, and he had been beaten severely. A week later, on October 30th, a 26-year-old man named Edgar Underkoffler disappeared from Illinois, but his body was not discovered until March 4th, 1983. A 25-year-old barman named John Johnson was discovered one month later in Indiana. On November 20th, Larry would abduct a 19-year-old hitchhiker named William Lewis somewhere in Indiana. William Lewis was stabbed to death and buried in a field. On December 19th, a 23-year-old named Stephen Agin was abducted. His body was discovered in a woodland close to Indiana State Road 63 on December 28th. 
While processing the crime scene, they would stumble across an outbuilding of an abandoned farm close to the crime scene, and there they found several traces of human flesh on the walls in areas where plaster had been damaged. This led investigators to believe that Stephen had been suspended against the walls of the property while his murderer inflicted the injuries to his body. Because he was so mutilated, the doctor that performed the autopsy said that this person had tremendous rage and added that in all likelihood, there had been more than one perpetrator in this murder. After this autopsy, the body of 21-year-old John Roach had been found close to Interstate 70 and the same doctor would note striking similarities in the injuries afflicted on John and Stephen. On December 30th, 22-year-old Yale University graduate David Bloch disappeared from his Illinois suburb. He had told his family he was going to visit a friend. His body was discovered by a farmer in a field south of Illinois. On January 24th, 1983, Larry would abduct and murder a 16-year-old named Irvin Gibson. His body was not found until April. His body had been found on top of a dog, which had been stabbed to death. Between March and April of 1983, it is believed that he killed a minimum of five further victims between the age of 17 and 29. On May 9th, Daniel Scott McNeve, who was 21, one, was discovered in a field close to Indiana State Route 39, and his wounds were similar to others. And once investigators got the autopsy back, they knew they had the same perpetrator. He had suffered 11 knife wounds to his neck, 5 to his back, and 11 to his abdomen. He had welt marks on his wrists and ankles, and his jeans had been pulled down to his ankles. But there was no signs that he was subjected to sexual assault. Nine days later, he would murder 25-year-old Richard Bruce. This time, he would throw his body from a bridge into a creek. When this task force formed, they would contact the FBI's National Crime Information Center, and they described the method of the murder and body disposal. And they wanted other police forces to look for any crimes that matched this, and if they found a pattern, to contact them. Shortly after, investigators in Kentucky would contact the task force. They would say a 29-year-old named Jay Reynolds had been discovered stabbed to death on March 22nd and that his body had likely been transported to the site of its discovery. Days later, investigators in Chicago reported the body of an 18-year-old male named Jimmy Roberts. He had 35 stab wounds and was found in a creek. And then on June 6th, a former lover of Larry's called the investigation team's confidential hotline to voice his suspicion that Larry might be the killer they're looking for. He would tell the hotline about the stabbing of Craig Long, that he had a violent temper and liked bondage. He would also tell investigators that in May of 1982, Larry had drugged a 14-year-old boy and would abandon the unconscious boy in a woodland. Although the boy had not been molested, investigators theorized the reason Eiler had given the boy sedatives was to test the effectiveness of the drug. So they dove in into looking at Larry as a suspect. They reviewed the 1978 attempted sexual assault, and they noticed that the youth had been handcuffed, and they realized that this seemed to match the M.O. of the highway murderer, as they had began to call their task force. The other victims had been discovered with welt marks on their wrists and ankles, and it appears that Larry was known to travel between Indianapolis and Chicago. So they decided to keep informal track of Larry's whereabouts, but didn't place him under full surveillance. The FBI would develop a psychological profile of the killer. They said that he was a white male in his late 20s or early 30s who worked in a menial profession and who presented a rough exterior in part due to his self-hatred regarding his sexual attraction to other men. They said he would project a macho image and that he would seek the company and approval of other masculine males in order to feel a sense of belonging. They said he would frequent, quote, redneck bars, and be something of a night owl, yet live on the edge of homosexual panic, always fearful of being labeled by others as queer. Because of this fear, the offender may express a hatred of homosexuals to mask his sexual attraction to those whom he sought the acceptance of. They predicted that upon completion of a murder, the offender would symbolically erase the act by making an effort to cover his victim with leaves or soil, and that this individual likely had a middle-aged, middle-class, and more intelligent accomplice and several of his initial homicides. They said because his victims were more athletic in stature that the offender was probably pretty physically strong. 
On July 2nd, an unidentified Hispanic man was discovered in a field two miles from Illinois, and he had been repeatedly stabbed in the abdomen. Eight weeks later, a tree trimming crew discovered the body of 28-year-old Raul Calis. By September, investigators from both jurisdictions in both states now believe that the perpetrator murdered up to 17 young men. And then a month later, on October 4th, two mushroom hunters would discover a human torso concealed in a plastic bag. The victim was 18-year-old Eric Hansen. His head, arms, and legs had been severed from his torso with a hacksaw, and the torso itself had been completely drained of blood. The skull and hands have never been found. On October 18th, the partially decomposed bodies of four further victims were discovered alongside an oak tree close to an abandoned farmhouse. Each victim had been dead for several months, and all four had been partially buried, with sections of the body of each victim remaining exposed above the ground. All of the victims were buried at one side of the tree, three feet apart, with their heads facing north, except one victim, an unidentified African-American man estimated between the ages of 15 and 18, was buried at the other side of the tree. All four victims had been stabbed more than two dozen times each, and the victim's pants were discovered around their ankles. On December 7th, a hunter discovered the partially buried skeleton close to Route 40. The victim was identified as 17-year-old Richard Wayne. A second body, less decomposed, was discovered beneath the remains of a burned mobile home, a few feet away from where Richard Wayne had been buried. They determined that this man was a black man between 5 feet 9 inches, but his remains were never identified. Larry would be arrested on September 30th in Indiana during a routine traffic violation. During this time, he had been in the company of a young hitchhiker, and both men were arrested and detained for questioning. Larry was initially detained for charges of solicitating a young male for sexual purposes. His car was searched along the roadside, and they discovered two sections of nylon rope. His vehicle was then impounded. Shortly after his arrest, they would interview Larry, and they told him that he was now a suspect of murders due to an anonymous phone call that they had received. He was very open to discussing his life and their suspicion of him having committed the murders, but he refused to discuss his sexuality. He did say that he read press coverages about some of the murders, but did deny having anything to do with them. He did consent to investigators' requests to conduct a forensic examination of his vehicle. He would allow them to take his mugshot, have copies of his fingerprints, and subject him to a polygraph test at a later date. While searching their truck, they found that rope, handcuffs, a hammer, two baseball bats, a mallet, and surgical tape. They did question him and alert the special task force that they might have the highway killer. It seems that Larry fit the profile of the killer almost perfectly. His lifestyle was quite a match to the man they were looking for, and he did admit to commuting back and forth during the week from the two areas where most of the bodies had been found. Unfortunately, investigators ultimately were forced to let him go, but they did manage to obtain a search warrant for his home. There, they would find tons of circumstantial evidence that linked him to multiple murders. Things like receipts for handcuffs, credit card statements that put him in suspected murder locations, knives, a hospital bill revealing he'd been treated for a deep knife cut to his hand, and investigators soon came to realize that Larry was the highway killer. One investigator would say, If Larry were not the murderer we were seeking, he was following the actual killer on a daily basis. On October 29th, a month after his first arrest, he was formally arrested and charged with murder. Because they had a pile of circumstantial evidence, he knew he needed a legal defense team. His team would argue that although their arrest for the traffic violation was legitimate, everything that happened after was not, including all of the searches that happened on his property. They said he hadn't been properly Mirandized before the searches and that despite the fact that he signed a Miranda waiver, the timing was suspicious. They would soon learn that one of the searches on his homes was technically illegal because the search warrant hadn't been obtained before the search. Larry's bond was soon reduced from $1 million to $10,000. In February of 1984, because of the help of his friends and family, Larry was able to make bond and walk free. On August 21st, 1984, a janitor would discover human remains in garbage bags in a Chicago apartment complex. This was the same apartment complex in which Larry had relocated to during his murder charges. 
The remains belonged to a 16-year-old runaway named Daniel Bridges. The teenager had been operating as a prostitute since he was 12, and his last job was with Larry. Larry bound the boy in his apartment where he beat and tortured him before stabbing him to death. He would drain the boy's blood and dismember him into eight pieces from his bathroom. He would place the dismembered body parts into separate garbage bags. Police realized that Larry was living in this complex, and several janitors placed him at the dumpsters the night before the body was discovered. He was arrested. He had spent all of his money on his first defense team, so he was forced to use public defenders. During the trial, they had mounting evidence against him. Fingerprints found on both the interior and exterior of the trash bags in which the body had been found, bloodstains in the apartment that suggested a heavy bleeding body was dragged across the floor, and various forms of restraints. Larry was found guilty of aggravated kidnapping, unlawful restraint, and murder. He was sentenced to death. It appears that in private conversations with attorney Kathleen Zellner, Larry would confess to more than 21 murders, and apparently she kept this to herself until after his death. In March of 1994, following complications from AIDS, Larry died. His last requests were that when he died, that attorney could share with the world his confessions and provide details of the individual cases that only the murderer would know, and he would implicate another person. The little was eventually acquitted. Larry would admit to kidnapping, raping, torturing, and murdering 21 young men and boys between the years of 1982 and 1984. He would list them by name, in his confession. It appears that Larry was quite the monster, and his crimes just grew progressively worse as he went on. I think it's interesting that he did implicate one of his romantic partners, but that person was ultimately acquitted. I'm very curious to know why he was acquitted. Did they have evidence that he was in fact not involved? Or did they just not have enough evidence to tie him to the crimes? But that's it for today, guys. If you like this video and want to support the channel, be sure to subscribe and turn on alerts so you never miss a video upload. If there's a case you'd like me to cover, pop in the comments below and I'll be sure to get to it. In the meantime, check out some other videos on my channel while you wait for the next upload and I'll see you then.